I would just like to give a very big thank you to my tier 5 channel members and patrons. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Duck Machine, Try Again 95, Estrella the Dreamer, Mesic, Feudic Joel, German Chemist, and Casper Amholtz. Thank you again very much. But, anyways, on to the story. When Death Worlders Meet, Part 11. Stephen reached out to catch Aranus as she fell, though there was only so much he could do from his reclined position against her dense weight. He collapsed under her, his back slamming against the floor. Her head landed next to his, so close that her open mouth practically surrounded the side of his face, a hot, humid breath of air buffeting his senses. Earlier, he would have estimated her weight to be around 75 kilos. Now, having collapsed while standing, she had felt at least twice that heavy. He couldn't move a muscle while pinned under her. He first tried to remove the dart from her side to get a better look at it, but he found that he could not. The moment he tried to move, he felt her fighting against him, her arm pressing down into his. You're muscle, she whispered, her long tongue licking his ear. His translator did its best as she tried to speak with her mouth gaping and awkwardly pressed against his head. He got the general idea. Clay, dead, clasp me. Without a second thought, Stephen went limp and closed his eyes. He felt her chest against him, slowly inhaling, then exhaling in a sigh of relief. They waited like that for seconds, then minutes. He was about to take a short nap made more difficult by her weight and a high body temperature, when he heard the door to the cargo hold sliding open. He opened his eyes just the tiniest fraction to the bright light outside, enough to see several figures silhouetted. The first one, he could tell, was Ginta. The others, maybe four. He had no idea beyond the fact that they all looked to be holding some kind of rifle. He readied himself to hold Aranus in place in case she decided to attack without warning. Yes, it looks like the altered night beast serum I prepared has knocked them both out. He could hear the centauroid doctor loudly saying from the doorway, It's safe. You can move her into the cage. I'll wait right here. Stephen could feel Aranus salivating, the warm fluid starting to pull around his cheek and ear. He really wanted a Q-tip and maybe a small towel, and she really needed a breath mint, or twenty. One of Ginter's escorts shoved the doctor in her upper back with the butt of his rifle. Not good enough, veterinarian, the crewman replied. You know what the captain said. Your drugs, you get to go in first to make sure they're not cold. We'll wait here. With another prod, he could see the doctor slowly trotting towards Aranus and himself, her hooves softly clapping against the deck plate with each step. He readied himself to hold Aranus tight if he had to. It would not help any of them to have her disembowel the good doctor. To his immense relief, he felt only his companion's hot breath and what might have been a growl from her stomach, even as the doctor hovered over them prodding them each with the turn of a hoof. Aranus made no move. Yes, my formulation has worked. They are definitely both out, the doctor said, stepping back. You can move them now. I would hurry, though. The effects of the drug may not last long. This is the first time we've tried something like this on the human species. Look at her. Not so tough now, is she? asked one, stepping over to where they lay. Stephen could see Ginter by the doorway now, staring right at him and nodding her head up and down in an exaggerated motion. No, she's nothing, said another crewman, crouching down beside them. He poked Aranus in the side. Look at her, she tried to protect her boyfriend. Ah, too bad, the witch. As soon as we got back into your cage, he's getting plasma bolts to the head. Those two were joined by the two others, and still Aranus hadn't betrayed any sign of life beyond the rise and fall of her chest. He could feel her breathing faster and her heartbeat pounding into his chest, though. Beyond that, however, 
She didn't move a muscle as each alien took one of her appendages in hand, tentacle, or other grasping organ. He began to wonder if perhaps something had gone wrong with the plan that everyone but him knew about, if she had been paralyzed, and if he would have to be intervene. He had almost resolved to stop them from taking her into that cage when a head fell into his lap. He rolled to his feet just as the creature that looked like a praying mantis bred with a buffalo fell to the deck, its head separated from its body by a good two meters now. Something with tentacles began to bring its rifle to bear on Aranus, only for Stephen to smoothly pry it away. He shot it half a dozen times while Aranus landed just as many of her powerful kicks to the third crewman. It occurred to Stephen that she might have been going easy on him on their tussle. Very easy. With both hands, she held onto the being a half meter taller than her while her hind legs kicked up into his abdomen and then slashed downwards. On the upswing, her legs operated like a kangaroo's might, stabbing into the alien with a dagger-like claws. On the downswing, her claws dug in deep, ripping and tearing and spilling blood, guts and bone with each motion. It was like being on the receiving end of a massive, intelligent, and angry reciprocating saw. When it looked like she was holding up to the being up by herself, all ability to stand on its own having departed with its life, she bit into its throat out of good measure. That only left the fourth crewman, who had backed himself away from the pair and made his way to the doorway. He held his rifle at the ready, taking turns aiming at Stephen, then at Aranus, as he carefully shuffle-stepped backwards. He was too scared to think rashly, Stephen rationalized, and had defaulted to trying to hold him in place. In moments, he would come into his senses and decide whether to fully commit to shooting or running. It was too late, though. The crewman had already made one fatal mistake. Situational awareness. Narrowness where her part had begun edging her way into the shadows and out of the swath of light cast by the open doorway. In front of her, she held the remaining upper half of the last crewman that she had killed, its entrails still spilling out, ostensibly as protection from the plasma rifle. It was equally as likely that she was just a nervous eater as she continued to bite off chunks from her kill and swallow as she apprehensively eyed the gunman. Stephen had begun to consider dropping his weapon and storing for time when, uh, for the second time that day, a head hit him in the stomach, or rather, most of a head. The blow hadn't been nearly as clean as the one of Aranus's slashes. Ginter's hind legs landed with an echoing thud and a bloody hoof prints. She then turned back around to face the pair. Let's go, she shouted. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed.